Okay, it is recording. Excellent. That is perfect. Um, I can hear myself, yes. I can hear myself as well. That's good. This I is good. All I checks done. I can also hear my internal monologue. That's, <laughs> that's rare. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> He's usually on holiday. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Shut Up, We're Talking, presented by R- Twin Radio. I am your host, Julian Myers, and with me on this marvellous venture is my co-host, Matisse Johnson. Hi. Excellent. Now I can get rid of my script. Perfect. Um, and we can talk about Blade Runner 2049. Oh, exciting. Uh, hopefully this all records perfectly. We're um, totally pros at our job. Oh, um, yeah. We didn't just spend the last half an hour trying to get some software to work. Yeah. And we're totally using this uh, technology in front of us like to the best ability that we can. I also don't know if I'm dropping out or not. Like, I feel like I am. A little bit. I think it's just to do with the headphone jack. I think it is. Yay, headphones are great. (laughs) Um, So this is potentially part of a trilogy of, like, radio thingies. It should be like a little mini-series. Yeah. Um, With, with like, each episode focusing on, like, something we enjoy, I guess. Yeah, uh, specifically about screen tech, uh, screen technology and culture. Yeah, kind of just like, yeah, a broad a film, but hopefully with topics that we kind of enjoy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, as I said, we're going to talk about Blade Runner 2049, and we have a marvellous big-ass book called The Art and Soul of Blade Runner 2049. It's, it's very impressive. It, it is. It's very orange. It um, is. For those, obviously, who cannot see it because we're on the radio, uh, and audio only, of course, hashtag audio, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I know how Twitter works, um, it's, what, like A3 size? Yeah, like, I'd say yeah. it's A3. Uh, very in-depth, like maybe over, maybe 100 pages, maybe more. I'd say about four centimeters thick. Yeah. We don't have a ruler, but we're, we're going on. F- going by eye. Yeah, going by eye. Perfect. Um, so who does it say that's written by? Uh, oh, Tanya Lapointe? Yeah, Tanya Lapointe, uh, forward by Denis Villeneuve, or Villeneuve, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name. Uh, but you probably like, butchered that, but that's fine. It doesn't matter, he's a cool director, we love him, he's the best. Um, I've seen all his films. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, super fan over here. <laughs> um, yeah, so, why are we talking about Blade Runner in regards to screen culture and technology? Do you want to... Intro us to oh, the, I draw, have draw me do. Oh, you! I have no idea. Right, cool. This is my forte. This, this is, is my, you. This is my favorite film uh, as of 2019, um, and will be as of 2049. <laughs> uh-huh. I totally won't have watched too many more films by you know. In no, this is it for you. This is the only film you'll ever watch for the rest of your life. Now, I mean, look, if I had to choose, it's not a bad film to watch for the rest of it's my true. life. It's true. Yeah, it's like either that or Evil Dead Two, and it's like yeah, yeah, uh, this one, yeah. yeah. Um, so. The reason why we want to talk about this one outside of yeah, it's my favorite movie, um, is also because a it's a sequel to a technologically brilliant film. I'd also um, say one of the best sequels. Oh yeah, definitely probably one of the best uh, sequels, if not the best sequel. But oh, of course, yeah. we have the fight against Star Wars for that. So Ooh. Yes, yeah. Ooh. yeah, but that also, I mean, we could arguably talk about that too, but I don't really want to. Um, it's the same kind of setup of these two, both films of Blade Runner and 2049, are both built on this idea of digital and practical effects with the modeling and, um, and like every technological detail that goes into it, especially if you've seen like the uh, three hour long documentary uh, Blade Runner. Sadly, I can't say uh, I have. What's it called? Dangerous Days? I have seen it. Uh, I, um, it is, I assumed so. It's, it's, I saw it earlier this year actually after watching this uh, Blade Runner and 2049 there. 4K remasters, um, <laughs> and all the shorts that came out before uh, 2049, of course. Why am I surprised? <laughs> you should you should not be surprised. This I'm is not. me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not now. This but, is you. But I, I'd always wanted to see the documentary, and it goes into the detail outside of the production issues, but of course all the technology that went into actually making the film of the models and all the practical elements. And there would have been well. so much because it's such a heavy technical it, film. It's ridiculous how much stuff there is. And of course, when they were making the sequel, they're like, we want to pretty much do the exact same thing mm. to the point that they even got this original screenwriter for Blade Runner to come oh, in well and that's be like, good. hey, we want to make a sequel. Yeah, no, and really Scott was kind of directed, but he ended up producing it instead. 
um, which I don't mind. Mm, me either. Uh, it gets allows me to say Denny Villeneuve more, which is great. I think by having the same screenwriter, like helping with it, it kept that same uh, flair as the other one as well. So it doesn't seem like when you get a new screenwriter in or something like that, or someone new in, it's so different. It yeah. can be so vastly different. This felt re- very reminiscent of the first Blade Runner. Yeah, and it's got the same similar themes and aspects in the way of, you know, actually showcasing this. Whereas if you say like um, Alien versus Aliens, oh. like. It, because it's two different directors. So and different. Yeah, and it's so yeah, exactly so different. It, they're both different representations of their time period, whereas 2049, the only real like modern day example outside of modern actors like Ryan Gosling and Anna de Armas, you got digital effects which make it look even better. But they just like, it's one of those mm. things, it's like, oh, we're going to use CG just to like really make everything punch more. Yeah, and like the use of not overusing CG, it kind of doesn't make it have that fake kind of glassy look that you're like, ew. Yeah. This yeah. kind of like everything looked real. Yeah. Like the, especially the CGI nothing, model face. Yeah, and nothing that looks got like me. A, nothing looks like a texture. It no. all just looks legit. Like es- especially the face where sh- they had modeled her face on. Yeah. Oh, I did not realize, and yeah, then I looked well, it up, and I was like, that. That's fake. Yeah, well, I was shocked. M- most of most of um, I'm actually kind of surprised because there's there's not much behind the scenes kind of stuff that I would love to see for 2049, um, because which is annoying, like on the Blu-ray and stuff, like the extra features, they don't have so much stuff going into the detailing. Although this book definitely does. Um, I haven't unfortunately read the whole entire thing, which is unfortunate. Oh, what type of fan are you? I know. I'm 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 an embarrassment to my kind. Um. But it's just, it's interesting to see, like, uh, for example, Anna de Armas, like, of course, she's a hologram for the mm. whole entire film. And there are the obvious se- behind the scene things where, like, oh, it's her on a green screen. They're like, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that. And it's just her in a singular hologram stuff, maybe, where she's the giant pink lady interacting with Kay on the bridge or it's some other scene. But for the most part, you don't get that one particular film i think it's Mackenzie davis who plays like the kind of robot prostitute oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and like when they merge <gasps> oh with the hands yeah. on his neck that was amazing the, the face on the face oh it's, yeah it's surreal like it's one of those moments where you look at it and you're like as a someone who looks at a lot of cg films and you're like okay that just brings me out of the film because it looks really bad it's like the uncanny valley oh the effect. uncanny valley yeah and this one when it's her face on her face it's like horrifying but yeah it's beautiful but like it, you know, it's fake. This but has it's got like, a, this film's got to definitely have some of the best visual effects. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and it won at the Oscars, didn't it? Um, it definitely won for cinematography. Yeah, I'm. Sh- I don't know who won for visual effects, but it should have yeah. been Blade Runner twenty twenty forty nine. I I've, I've, I don't know if it did. I don't. I can't be bothered looking it up. I I should, but I'm not going to because I don't. I don't like the Oscars. I'll be either. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's. Should we talk about, like, the story of the film or anything? Like, I think you should do a quick synopsis. Also, yeah. spoiler warning, I'm very, very sorry. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's been out for, like, what, since 2049? It's, what, 2080 now? Totally, we are in that year. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's a bad joke. Um, You're forgiven? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, the plot takes place 30 years after the original Play Runner, which is coincidentally set in 2019. Um, and what is it? The, you've got Agent K who's played by Ryan Gosling, who is a replicant, which means he is a android that looks like a human. Um, and he is a Blade Runner, so he hunts down old models pre-blackout of other androids. Um, the blackout pretty much being self-explanatory. Everything turned off for like about a week or something. Um, they have animated shorts that go into detail as to how it happened and why it happened. Um, and it was all the rebellion caused by the replicants as it was. Um, and it's just pretty much about him looking through this mystery of this pretty much bag of bones that he finds underneath a tree, uh, which turns out to be the bones of a replicant who is, uh, what's, damn, what's her name? Sean Young's character from the first film. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, that's embarrassing. It's been a while since I've seen the first one. Uh, Rachel, that's her name. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's it's her bones, and they find out, you know, oh, she's you know, she gave birth. You can see by these things of the bones, and then they realize, oh, if you look even closer, you'll see her serial number. And they're like, oh, but that's impossible. How can a robot, you know, an android have a kid? That's literally impossible. Um, And so Kay has to investigate this whole entire thing and find who the kid is. And, of course, he's 
got his superiors, the police, the, I think it is LAPD, mm. uh, you know, breathing down his neck about it. And then you also have the, you know, people at the Wallace Corporation uh, who designed him and all the modern day uh, androids uh, or skin jobs. Oh, and they have a short lifespan, don't they? Um, the, the older ones, the older models well, did. Like four years. Uh, yeah, the in the first one, yeah, the old models, which were even like the most advanced, the Nexus 9 or Nexus Plus, whatever, uh, were like four-year runtime. So hence why like Roy Batty, the villain of the first one, arguably villain of the first one, didn't last that long. Like, yeah, because like the, the, lifetime. the replicants, as I understand, were meant to be better than humans. So they were built to be stronger. So they took on a lot of work that humans didn't want to do or couldn't do. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So they went to off-world colonies. Uh, col- colonies, yeah. I can I can tongue words, right? Yeah, I got tongue tied. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's they went to off-world colony colonies. Yeah, that's I'm um, doing it again. Um, so they could, I don't know, mine stuff from. Yeah, like, they never really go into a lot of detail, but it's because no. it's not about the off-world colonies. No. That's they're meant to be the whole. Oh, it's the future prospect. You can move out there, and everything's. Well, great. You got pretty much robot slaves. It's great. Beautiful. Yeah. What a dream. It's very much a film noir, or like a neo noir. Oh, the, the first one, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think I'd argue this one probably is too. Yeah, I'd say it has the same of the hallmarkers. Yeah. Um. Of course, the film is uh directed by, by Dina uh, Denis Villeneuve and even photographed by Roger Deakins, who is oh, famous wow. for his cinematography and is arguably most people's favorite cinematographer. Yeah. I agree. I mean, obviously. He's very he's, popular. Yeah, obviously he's mine, but you know. <laughs> and that's all that matters. Yes, that's all that matters. I'm the most important person in this room. This is my show. Yes. Um, yeah. I, it's, I really should have written down notes for what else to say about this film. But let's go into the, I guess, the culture of this film. Why is it relevant in our culture today? Um, I'm ans- okay, you can answer this question. Go on. Uh, that why it's irrelevant in yeah. our culture today. Yeah. Well, it's what we're heading towards, isn't it? With the rise of androids and stuff like that. And also to do with like morality and stuff like that. Yeah. Because like you said, how can robots have children? Yeah. Yeah. The whole question of the two films is what does it mean to be human? Yeah. Um, that's one. I was, I was, I was leaning. Well, I was gonna go into the whole fact that it's a sequel. Oh yeah. Uh, well, it is. A, it also is one of full of. I'd also say. It, oh and yes. Reboots. Yeah. So I'd, like the film culture in particular. In particular. Well, that goes into like cult culture because Blade Runner is a very. It's much as much as it is a classic piece. It's, it's also a cult film. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and it's because obviously the first Blade Runner like heavily bombed at the box office mm-hmm. because of. All the things that the uh, studios did to make it worse than it... I was going to say worse than it already was, but no, it's its terrific. They just made it worse. Um, for example, the use of uh, Dickard's voiceover and all this kind of stuff that made it just seem... Uh, Tacky? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it had no like heart to it. Like yeah. It just, yeah. But then, of course, they released the director's cut, which, of course, wasn't actually the director's cut. It was just, let's take out the part where you know, Dickard is talking the whole time, and then it becomes an artsy film piece mm-hmm. and then they're like yeah cool okay that's good and that's um, like the whole thing of like cult culture where they keep it it's like an underground kind of thing where like fans keep it alive by re- and that's why i think what the fans did with this yeah yeah definitely um it's probably got definitely specific areas say in the u.s for example where it came out in the theaters and everyone loved it and it kept coming back to it like um rocky horror picture show for oh, definitely yeah um and of course we've i we've been lucky enough to get 2049 which is just something else. I think I expected it to happen because it had such a large fan following. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, given especially how it's always in like those, you know, top 10 what's the greatest sci-fi film of all time or even what's the greatest film of all time. Usually it's sci-fi, of course. Um, um, and plus going back to what I was saying about morality and stuff, it's it's very kind of in tune with what we are doing with technology now with the rise of kind of like androids and like having like Siri on your phone and everything and stuff like that. Like, what does it actually mean to be human? Cause like, yeah. like with the whole like blackout thing, how can you survive without technology for like a day? Yeah. It's that whole kind of question of like what we're doing with technology. Yeah. And that's the, the joy of having joy in the film. Ah. <laughs> joy is a character played by Anna de Amis, who is pretty much, um, she's a product of the Wallace corporation. She is the hologram girl. Um, and is, uh, the, one iteration of her is the girlfriend of Kay's character. Um, 
she lives in his home uh, for a projection device. Uh, but then even the first time you see her, she gets uh, he gets a thing that allows her to roam free so she can be more real. Um, and the whole point of her question, uh, the whole point of like her being in the film too, is this whole idea of you know the whole question of loneliness. Does like an android need to have someone to talk to and someone to care about? You know, because of course androids, these androids are programmed to be the most human, so of course they yeah. So they'd be self learning, so they have uh, almost everything human emotions. Yeah, exactly. Wise. So you'd expect that Kate's probably depressed through most of this film. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Of course, Anna de Armas is there to make him feel just that inchy bit better. Um, and she does, not just him, but also the audience, because she's great. Um, and, of course, that comes into fruition later in the film, where they have this whole, like, developed relationship. She, unfortunately, gets pretty much killed off. Mm. Um, but then they have a scene later towards the end of the film, which I argue is probably my favourite scene in the film, where he is, as I said before, she's the giant pink lady who is an ad with black eyes, completely naked, blue hair, um, and she goes over to him, and she, pretty much every single thing that she says and does is so contradictory of, like, it, it places a, an irony of his whole relationship with the previous version of her, where she gives him a name and calls him Joe, you know, she says all these lines of dialogue, which are all pre-programmed, and he mm. realizes this when this giant hologram version of her, who is literally completely exposed, but has as they say, no soul because of the, her eyes are black. There's no gateway into her yeah. soul or whatever, which is another fascinating commentary on the film. Oh, definitely. Um, and it just provides this whole, like, this is you know, obviously his turn, major turning point in the film where he realizes that his whole life is pretty much been pointless. He's just been programmed to just do whatever people tell him to do. Yeah. And that's why it's my favorite scene in the film because it's great. It not, really not does just the giant pink lady, like naked lady. It's not just that. Yeah, definitely not the pink naked lady. No, of course not. <laughs> and not not the pretty visuals. <laughs> oh, it is. It, it is, is. But it visual is. wise, it is beautiful. It is. it is such an amazing scene and an amazing film, of course. Oh, definitely. I think it, it comes down to, uh, again, cinematography and also really good writing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Question. Um, yeah. Is uh, Deckard, is a Harrison Ford, he was a replicant, right? Um... Because I'm pretty sure, didn't the director outright say that he was, but there were short stories that also kind of contributed to that? Yeah, well, really Scott suggests that he is, especially in his final cut of the film where Deckard has this dream of a unicorn and then one of the characters later on who does origami actually has an origami unicorn, which they had filmed, obviously was in the original version, the theatrical cut of the film, and it was just kind of like, okay, why? So it just proves that the, the guy who's hunting them was there, but now it's got this whole more interpretation of, oh, well, Deckard was dreaming of a unicorn. This guy did a unicorn as an origami, so obviously it means that, you know, Deckard's a replicant. Um, I don't think he is. I mean, even 2049 has that whole scene where Deckard is with Wallace, uh, played by Jared Leto, and they have, he ha suggests this whole thing of maybe this whole entire day of you meeting Rachel was like, you know, pre-programmed into both of you and everything was meant to be, like, it was too perfect a day. But then even he says, well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just, you know, sheer luck. Leaving it ambiguously, so, yeah. yeah. So obviously the writer was like, I'm not going to answer the question as to whether, because I don't think even the writer of both of these two films was like, no, he's not a, he's not a replicant. He's just a, he's just a dude. Just a, just, a, just a normal guy. Yeah, and I don't like to think that he is a replicant because it kind of takes away a lot of the... I think so as well, actually. Um, the kind I of the spirit of the first yeah. film. Um, and, of course, how could he be re a replicant if he survived this long as well? Like, I was thinking that. Yeah. So there were... There's you know, kind of like conflicting stories here. Yeah. You mm. could argue your interpretation. Of course, Ridley Scott still says that he is a replicant. I think Harrison Ford, who plays Deckard, says Yeah, they says had a whole that, fight about it. Yeah. I, I'm very sure Harrison Ford has disagreed with so like, no, why wouldn't he be a replicant? That's that's dumb. Um but yeah, I mean that even that whole scene with the unicorn wasn't yeah. even from Blade Runner. It was from like Legend or whatever. It was a different film by Ridley Scott where oh, it yeah. had a unicorn. And they're like, hey, let's just grab some of this footage, chuck it in the final cut of Blade Runner. Boom! Now he's a replicant, maybe. <laughs> Big question mark. And on that question mark, let's play some music because I need to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, got my phone plugged in here. Um, what song should we go to? I have the uh, Blade Runner 2049 soundtrack. 
Of course you do. Of course, Of yeah. course you do. It's funny. She already knew this, but she she had to say that line anyway. Yeah, because of course you do. Yes. <laughs> so what song should we play? I actually don't know what half of them sound like because there's a lot of them and they're great. So play your favorite. Um, actually, I think I'm going to go with a Elvis Presley song. Bang in. Yeah. Good choice. Uh, there's got Suspicious Minds. Oh. So, yeah. Um, we'll take a break and you can listen to Suspicious Minds and we'll be back after the break. Perfect. I didn't do the scene from... <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we are back. We are back. Oh, it's weird to play music on your phone and have to make sure it stops on time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully. So, unfortunately, I have the, uh, we have some pretty, I mean, our audio jacks are okay, I guess. It just, it keeps dropping out in my, my headset. Oh, yeah, so same I'm, here. I'm Especially just yours. Does mine keep dropping out? No, yours is fine. Oh, perfect. But it might be because I'm Just like too me. Much. <laughs> um, so I thought we might talk about more of the, like, uh, technical aspects of the film. So, like, the CGI. Um, by far some of the best I've ever seen. Especially the scene with the face replacement with um, what was the so this is Sean Young as Rachel. Oh yeah, um, the scene I mentioned where uh, Deckard and uh, Wallace are in the same room, and you know Wallace is saying, "Oh, maybe you're a replicant, maybe not." But the point is, sorry, is that was that the actual dialogue? Cause yes, that's exactly. It what sounded he even does spinning goofy, image. He says he does goofy arms in the air and everything. I'm trying to <laughs> visualize three words of what I just did. Oh, perfect. Um, and so right, he. To kind of prove his point, Wallace's point of, uh, like, you know, history can repeat itself, or, like, we can do this all over again, um, even though he can't get the original version of Rachel as it is, because, obviously, the guy who pro- who made Ro- Rachel in the first place uh, from the first film, and Tyrell, I remember, haha. <laughs> Good work. Um, <laughs> he... He obviously had made her in a way that she actually could uh, become pregnant, which would me- make her the first ever replicant to have a child, um, which is pretty much the whole point of this film. Yeah. In a way. Like, it's the whole reason it is, al- is you know, I'd say alive. Um, but, of course, it's because they want to make another movie, which is good. Oh, yeah. But will it, again, that's what happens with, like, sequels. Will it be as good as the other one? Yeah. And so the I remember even in this book especially, um, it starts off with one of the producers of uh, the original film um, saying how he wanted to make a sequel and like you know it had been he'd been trying to maybe try to make it for like twenty years uh, and it wasn't until it re- really came back big on DVD that he's like yeah actually we could totally do this um, and he was a big hand in uh, getting the casting and the director and the writer and everyone back. Mm. Um, unfortunately, he passed away before the film was released, so he oh, was never that's... able to actually see the final product. But even the people, like his closest family and friends and colleagues, even all agreed that this film was ex- exactly what he wanted it to be. Um, so there's different visions that have gone into this film outside of it. Luckily, all those know. visions are complementary. So they don't yeah. like, no, no one's vision has been too too strong yeah and it's taken away from the film i think the only vision that was bad was the advertisers <laughs> oh that's true because when i saw the ads it's like oh it's this big explosive action film i'm like oh but that just ruins See, the that's whole what point I expected of the first as well. Well. yeah but no it, it actually is the ads were atrocious but um i still wanted to watch it and i did and i w- can i ma- briefly talk about my first e- my experience watching it for the first of time of course you can okay cause we have time for that yeah we have plenty of time this is on you yeah um, so, of course, in Australia, we have this thing called a uh, Hoyt Extreme Screen Cinema. Um, and we, this is me, my dad, and my two brothers. We went to the, uh, the cinema to see it, and it was booked out. There's only four seats left at the very back row. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. You know, it shouldn't be that bad. Um, it was, but it wasn't. So, we got there, and when they started playing, because, of course, oh, there's all this atmosphere around it, all these extra sound effects just for, like, the whole life around the film. That's, like, 90% of what I heard. Every scene with Wallace talking, I didn't know what he was saying. Every time there was an <laughs> echoey fi- part of the film, especially in Wallace's headquarters, I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I didn't understand half of Like, I understood what I needed to, because visually it conveys itself a lot. Yeah. Um, But I had no idea what the hell Wallace was saying. I'm like, what the hell's the point of Jared Leto if you can't hear what he's saying? Of course, it's just because I was obviously sitting at the background speakers of the surround sound. Also, I think it's a tell of a good film if you can just understand it visually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm trying to fix up my headphones. I think I can't even... Okay, now I can hear myself. Yeah, I can hear you as well. Um, yeah, so that made me a little annoyed, but even by the time I finished watching the film, I was like, 
It was a good film. Visually, like, great. Everything about it was, oh, it was a beautiful film. But then I was like, as much as I didn't hear those particular scenes, because I heard the world, like, mm. I felt like I was, I didn't exactly feel like I was in the world because I was still at the background of the cinema. Um, but it was just kind of transformative. Like, it made me really feel like I was somewhere else just through audio alone. Oh, wow. And I think the next time I saw it was, like, at, like, the Astor Theatre. Like so did 4K. you not see it in the back this time? No, I saw it in, the, like, one of the front <laughs> so rows. So you got better seats this yes, time? <laughs> I even got to see it on f- as, a f- as a 4K projection. Oh, wow. Look was, at you. Yeah, that was, like, my second time I'd Would you see it, it in 4D? <laughs> Um, no, yes. There'll be a lot of rain. Oh, yeah. I'd get a, I'd get a head cold from it, probably. Beautiful. What, well, you already got that? Yeah, I know. I already have a head cold. That's not the point. All the shaking and the back tickling? Yeah. Be great. Yeah. Um, every, every time Joy touches Ryan Gosling's <gasps> You'd face. You'd feel it. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that whole thing. Oh, if they had it around your neck as well, when she brings the hands down. Yeah. You'd have to have like two different like, wind settings. That would be very, very weird. That'd be really cool. Hopefully not too arousing. So arousing. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the second time I watched it, I was able to watch it properly and Perfect. be able to experience the film for what it was in terms of dialogue and narrative. And it was even better. Oh, yeah. Um, obviously, because I knew what the hell was going on. So, of course, back to the face replicant scene. Uh, of course, Sean Young doesn't look like she did back in the 80s. Oh, definitely not. Which is fair enough. I, I mean, like, we can't exactly say that no one ages. I mean, outside of Keanu Reeves, everyone and ages. And Paul Rudd. And Paul Rudd, yeah. No, he is, like, 50. Yeah, he, he is looks 50. like a 13-year-old. I know. I know. It's great. It's sh- it's shocking to me. But back to what we're saying. Let's talk about a tangent on Paul Rudd. Uh, <laughs> that was one of my favorite scenes because it was it was executed really well. Yeah. There's been face replacements in the past that have really sucked. Yeah. So, like, in The Sopranos, they did a really terrible one. <laughs> Like, it's just wobbling head. Do you remember that? It's yes. really, really bad. I've never even seen the show, but I've seen that scene. Oh, that scene? Like, it's oh infamous. It's God. awful. It is really, yeah. They stepped up a little bit with Carrie Fisher in Star Wars. But, uh, a bit. Yeah, but her, she just looked, it, it looked weird. It, it, looked, it looked out of place. Like it was definitely real and definitely, like, was, oh, it was on oh, her face yeah. enough, but it just looked like a soulless creature. Oh, had, yeah. It lacked yeah. what Carrie Fisher had. Yeah, soul well, and uh, charisma. Yes. Rest and in peace, Carrie Fisher. I'm and, sorry. And life in her face. Yeah, that's true. This was done in such a way that I didn't know it was a CGI. I thought it was a person. They did it with key lighting and they had limited facial movement. So it's not like the rock in that movie where he's like a scorpion. Oh, yeah. The mummy returns. That's terrifying. That's, that was a great film. That totally does not age film. well. I mean, no, but it was still fun. I think the f- twenty Blade Runner twenty forty nine was possible because of the technology we have, oh, and definitely. by using f- like physical effects and special effects in conjunction. Like in the book, it says that they were using actual physical sets, yeah. So they made tiny miniatures to do it, so yeah. it looked so real. Which is the very in con- like very similar to the original Blade yeah. Runner. Yeah, because I think that's stuff. what he was saying. He wanted it to be like the original Blade Runner because it has that love of the fans. Because f- not a lot of people use physical effects anymore. Yeah. It's all special effects. So that well, to me... this is still special effects. It's all digital effects. Yeah. But even this film uses digital effects, but it uses like to enhance, yeah. not to replace. It uses it sparingly enough that yeah. it, it it feels so real. So that scene and also the scene with the... She's a prostitute? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wet. It was beautiful. It was the best scene ever. Yeah. Where her and Anna de Armas come oh. in. They synchronize oh, into yeah. one thing. Oh, yeah. It was cr- it was like a little unnerving at first, and I was like, "Yeah, I can get down to this." I think, arguably, because those two are obviously the most notable scenes for the digital effects. Oh yeah. Um, and of course, I, I think for the one of Anna Darmus, I I still watch it. I'm like, "How the hell did they do this?" But obviously, they just filmed the scene with the actual. Yeah, and then they actors. had to they had to morph it over. Yeah, and they just had Anna Darmus just watch it and just try to her best to do the same. Yeah, but no, because they had it. They did a choreographed first. Yeah, they have a they have a choreographed. So everything was kind of in time to a certain degree. Yeah, of course. Because if we had yeah. one person up here and the other person's already down yeah. doing something else, so she's not always improvising. No, it was just, it was enough choreographed. Of, just enough of her own. I'm my own person, person doing yeah. this. You know, like she's where she's kissing Kay, but the girl has her eyes open, but Joy yeah, doesn't. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. In the fashion, as she is programmed to. Um, that scene next to, uh, this one where Rachel comes back from oh. the dead, um, is still great. Like, because they actually use a real life actress. Yeah. They completely remodeled 
I mean, she was a very good lookalike. Yeah, for very, Sean very Young. good. Well, like, I, I, with any good face replacement, you need a good lookalike. Yeah, like the whole Paul Walker thing. For also, uh, another good notable one that they did, uh, uh, Hugh Jackman in Logan. It was his stunt double. Oh, yeah. The, from the neck up. Was yeah, all CGI. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was, yeah, that is really fun. That was uncanny. Um, yeah, and it's, to, to put in those kind of, like, places where, like, because usually they, they try to do it to make it, I don't know, wh- what's the best version of why they would replace someone's face? Because obviously in the in Logan they did it because it was of the action scene. It was, it kind of needed to be done. Yeah. Um, But of course they even had the clone of him for like yeah. half of that film. Um, And then you've got uh, Rogue One, which... Bring it as back m- from the dead. As much as, as much as, well, Carrie Fisher hadn't even passed away by that stage, but like they had her obviously... Her, the younger looking yeah. version of her just to say that last line of the film. Which yeah. There's no real, I don't see there's any real point as to why Again, she's that's in just the film. like a, it's just an Easter egg for the fans because yeah. Carrie Fisher was such a big, important part of the franchise. But then they had Grand Moff Tolkien as well, Tarkin. Yeah. Oh, but that was different. Because they he had a full, is dead. Yeah, he had a full 3D. Has three, been for a while. The way they did that, they had a full 3D model yeah. made of him for yeah. another film. But again, oh, it still looked waxy. Yeah, yeah. It didn't s- look real. But they did well with some of them because of the lighting that they use. If you yeah. use key lighting and make sure most things are in shadows, yeah. it can look s- sort of real. Yeah. But again, the skin texture was... Yeah, Ill. it still wasn't human enough. No, yeah. not like in Blade Runner. That yeah. was uncanny. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, where Sean Young comes back. And it's not, of course, not Sean Young, but someone who is pretty much the same height and yeah. everything, same costume, same hairdo. But they've completely remodeled her face oh, like yeah. from scratch. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the same company that does that did all the de-aging for uh, a lot of the other movies. So Like, like the Marvel Sam, films? Yeah, Sam Jackson. Yeah. So they did that as well. Um, they did uh, Captain America. Oh, yeah. Because that was an actor, but all this, so they layered something else on him. So yeah, that was a weird... We've, this is the first Avenger. Yeah. Um, they had a stunt double that was shorter than uh, Chris Evans mm. and they'd match them together where they'd be able to put his like Chris Evans yeah. head onto the smaller body but then build up the smaller body a bit to make him yeah. more realistic. Would, but what was funny when I was uh, reading about it, a lot of the scenes are actually just Chris Evans and they've just shrunk him down. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes but they because they, has, they filmed in such a high resolution when you shrink it down it gets into an even higher resolution. Yeah. So he very, looked yeah. crystal clear yeah, yeah, compared yeah. to all the other actors. Yeah. But yeah, I think this is what Blade Runner 2049 does so well. So it doesn't look janky. It doesn't look fake. Yeah. Everything in that film looked real to me. Like it could be like I was living in that yeah. universe or in like, that world. I mean, even like the holograms look it like looks, real holograms. Yeah. But that's not hard. Like they've been able to do that for like 20 years now to make holograms. Even then, good. but it kind of looks a little like, you know, on the nose. Yeah. So this, yeah. I was kind of like, everything in this film, I feel like could happen in the future. Which was, uh, it was kind of like, when you go into a film and you're kind of like in and you're immersed, that's, I felt pure immersion with that film. Yeah. I walked yeah. out and was disappointed with what life was now. Yes. <laughs> so that's the thing. You compared it to um, Furious 7, for example, uh, where of Talking course- Talking about my <laughs> favorite film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had to bring back uh, Paul Walker- Unfortunately, from the dead, because he had obviously passed away during the production of the film. Uh, but conveniently, his two brothers looked almost identical to him, so mm-hmm. they just face swapped. But you can still see... In a lot of the film, in a lot of the scenes, it's actually his double, but yeah. you can't realise. Like the one where he's carrying the baby into the car. Yeah, that's well. the scene I, I was mo- actually going to... That's most, the one I yeah, think of the most. It's really, really... I, it was it's, kind of like... It's good, but it's ne- it's never perfect. No. I think maybe his scene where, like, his final scene where he's driving away, that's Arguably as most perfect to real as they got in the film, but they try, I think that's when they tried it's their hardest The only on. thing that ruined it for me was the eyes. Because it wasn't looking at Vin Diesel. It was looking a little bit further away from Vin Diesel. Mm. And I was like, I was looking, I was like, where, where are you looking? <laughs> yeah. But that was just, it was just an unfortunate, like, circumstance. The that, eyes are the hardest yeah. thing to get right with CGI. Yeah. And especially face replacement. Because the yeah. eyes are what kind of create the whole thing. Because yeah. your eyes are so expressive. Like I, I would argue that the mouth was probably oh, harder that's, because that's there were so many mu- muscles and skin that, yeah. because it's pores. Like when you when you smile or when you are you telling me the whole face is hard to make? <laughs> yes. yes, 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 it is. Because yeah. like you've got skin that moves and then your eyes crinkle and stuff like that, and your pores stretch. Yeah, you have to have a whole rendering engine for that. Yeah, it's it's and mental. special programming. So I wonder what the special effects budget was for. 
um, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's yeah. I've I don't really want to. What was I mean, the budget in general? I have honestly no idea. I mean, you'd feel I'd feel like you know it's like oh people could argue that's your favorite film. You should know all this stuff. It's like um I mean yes but no I don't need to. Wow. Like, it's not like I just like go through the IMDb trivia every day and update it to make to. A hundred and fifty million in box office. Okay. Opening weekend, it made thirty-two million. On the opening weekend in America, hmm. that's a lot of money. So is that is that that's the domestic? Yeah. So is that one fifty million the domestic or like the whole world wide? Okay. So budget estimated. So that we don't ever really have like any physical kind of proof. Mm. Is uh, one hundred fifty million. So cumulative worldwide gross, it um, uh, two hundred and sixty million. Okay. A little over that. So it didn't get all of its... It's one of those things where it's like, you got to account for like marketing as well. Oh, yeah, because marketing um, would be a separate thing on top of that. Yeah. And so obviously, uh, they didn't get their money back. Like, they did, but they didn't get all of their money back. Oh, which yeah. Is and it, it's so expensive to get um, uh, Harrison Ford. Yeah. And it's kind of... It feels kind of ironic that like at the same time, like they've done a remake... Well, not a remake. They've done a sequel to Blade Runner and it goes through the exact same thing of doesn't get its money back. But it still gets critically received. Everyone, mass audiences like it. I think this was just for the fans. Like, it seemed like it was a fan service thing as well. Because, yeah. like, this was so wanted and needed. Yeah. And I feel like, because my, my mum had wanted to watch this film for a while. Um, of course she would. Because, obviously, I wouldn't shut up about it. Um, <laughs> and so, we she decided, okay, let's let's spend the day. We'll watch the two Blade Runner films. Um and so I showed her the first one first. Um, Good choice. And then I showed her the second one. Uh, she actually prefers the second one. I don't know why exactly, but I mean, it might just be because there's, I don't know. That's just me as well. I prefer the second one. Yeah, I mean, obviously I do too. I love the first one, but I wouldn't. No, I was going to say I wouldn't consider it a Harley. I, I, I would obviously. It's a, it's a near perfect film. Obviously, the second one I prefer. Oh, yeah. But I think the first one, you've also got the element of like. In the mind, in the back of your mind, you've got all the, you know, the releases, the versions. Mm-hmm. So you got like, I've always wanted to see the theatrical yeah. cut. I'm never going to. I don't really. Think it's I kind should, of like it's yeah. tainted because of that. Yeah. Whereas 2049 is so pure in its own way. Like they made it because they wanted to. That's not why for the I don't money, think they're worried the about. Art. Yeah. That's yeah. why I don't think they're worried about getting money back. Yeah. Well, they did get a significant amount back. Yeah. And like the fact that people were saying like, oh, like, oh, is it gonna? Are they gonna make a sequel? Probably not because it flopped. It flopped like American domestically because America, I, I guess, dumb people who oh, don't definitely. like good movies. I agree. No, yeah. but most things for Americans are dumbed down. Yes. So that movie not being dumbed down what and uses... What are you talking about? Fast and Furious is the smartest movie around. Don't talk about it. It's my favourite thing ever. Every I, one I, of them. Every I, one of them are good. I do like those movies. Yeah, they're phenomenal. Especially they get better every every year. Especially Tokyo Drift. <gasps> Don't talk about my favourite film. I, 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 I love Tokyo Drift. <laughs> it's so good. I really, I really like it. Spoiler, when Han died, I cried. And I was 14. I mean, Han dies in every film. <laughs> Don't bring that up. <laughs> Um, uh, I have some trivia about Blade Runner. I want to see if you actually know it, since you're such a big fan uh, of the film. David Bowie was the first choice uh, for Neander Wallace, but he died before uh, the start of shooting. I didn't know that. I don't really... Really? I don't really care. I but mean, look, David I, Bowie! I know I love David Bowie too, but it's like... As if you'd like, turn on the film and like David Bowie shows up, as if that was not the coolest thing. I don't know. It just... Some actors feel right in their place, like... Hey, like... like no, like, they feel right for the character. Are you saying David Bowie isn't right for the character? Have you seen The Labyrinth? I, I have seen Labyrinth. The best film ever? I, I, it isn't, but um, I, have, <laughs> <laughs> I have seen it. It's a good film. However, I don't think he'd be good for Wallace. It just doesn't feel like his kind of performance. Like, I feel like he'd be better as, like, Agent K than he would oh, be I as agree, Wallace. Oh, I agree, actually. Like, especially if you've lo- watched the, uh, was it, The Man Who Fell to Earth? Man Who Fell to Earth? I think so. Yeah, which is a, like sci-fi film he did back in the eighties, um, and it seems like his kind of character, whereas Wallace doesn't. Yeah, and thinking over his filmography, he really doesn't. Mm. Like, like I'm thinking more towards like Twin Peaks, and even oh yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's not exactly a Wallace type of character, whereas Jared Leto, as much as he's a what's the, what's the kind of actor that they call it, the method actor, at the same time, if even if he wasn't a method actor, he kind of he 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 has the presence for Wallace, I think. 
Okay. And the way he pr- portrayed the character, I think, was perfect. Exactly I disagree with you, but that's fine. Okay. What, would you, just, you just prefer David Bowie? Oh, hell one? yeah. Okay, It'd be awesome if David Bowie was there. Like he just suddenly springs out and... And then an sings a ballad? Song. Hell yeah. Would have made that movie 10 out of 10. 11 out of 10. Um, the opening scene in which Cake and Franz Sapper Morton is nearly an exact remake of the scene written and storyboarded, but never filmed for the original Blade Runner. That's fair enough. Yeah, I, that was Sapper Morton's, uh, Dave, Dave Batista's character? Yes. Yeah, 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 no, I remember that. With his tiny glasses. Yes, his tiny glasses. <laughs> yes. Wood is rare and valuable in 2049, as shown by the wooden house, horse yeah. Kay owns. Yeah. Explain. Why is it rare? Um, because natural resources are very limited, especially living natural resources, same as animals. That's why. It so any kind of like car w- wouldn't it wouldn't be around anymore. You no. know when remember when like wooden paneling was a thing. Yes, I do actually. Um, but like uh, they have a tree that they show in twenty forty nine. It's a dead tree. Oh yeah. And uh, and you know like there's just no value to it because it's dead. See, this is what I'm talking about with like what's it going to happen in the future? That's going to happen in the future. That's yeah. terrifying. Yeah. That's why I came out of the fil- like film guy and like ooh. You need to sit down for a minute. I'm a little worried. Talking about sitting down for a minute. It's time for another break. Oh, what a segue. Oh. 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 <laughs> I was like panicking because I'm like, I think we need to have at least two breaks. Yes. Maybe I'll find a, f- a song that's, um. Uh, oh, what am I doing? That was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. <laughs> that's really worrying because it doesn't look like you do. Uh, I'm trying to find a good song to play. I might play this song. It's called Joy. Uh, the soundtrack, obviously J O I, not J O Y. Uh, I it's luckily the last song in the soundtrack, so we'll hopefully just stop once that happens. That'd be nice. Um, I was hopefully gonna. I should have actually looked for good, better songs for the film because it could just be really quiet because some of the soundtrack is quiet. It's fine. Then they get to have a nap. Really, some of it's really loud. So yeah, we will be back in a short few, maybe ten minutes. Hopefully not. If the song goes over five minutes, we'll probably cut it halfway yes, through. Yes, definitely. Okay, and let's 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 go for All it. All right. Cool. I'm disappointed that you didn't want David Bowie to be playing it. He is an icon. I hope they heard this. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. What a man David Bowie is though. Oh, him with his labyrinth hair and la, camel toe? La, la, la. No, him with his labyrinth camel toe? Ten out of ten. <laughs> See? Imagine that coming on screen. I've seen like, Labyrinth in 4K. I bought the 4K when it came out. I I'd, had, ne- I'd never seen I it I had the Labyrinth and Dark Crystal all on... Say, I've got the Dark yeah, Crystal yeah, one yeah. in booklet yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. I've still never seen the film. What? But I haven't. It gave me nightmares as a kid. I've never, I never saw either of them as a kid. So this is a three minute long song. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Please do not die. I can't do this alone. I have to cough now. How, how, am, I gonna, cough how am I going to rant about um, Death Note to people? There's a gallon audience. Oh. You're not gonna cut out my dancing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I don't know if I filmed it. Was that what before? No, no, no. Recorded? When the JoJo opening comes on, when I play my JoJo opening, oh, yes, shit's gonna hit the fan. Okay. Look at that though. Oh. Yeah, that's on the neon shit. I love it. It's so beautiful. I imagine I want the teddy bear for my room. <laughs> How cool is that? Lights up, really light. <laughs> when people come into my room, Blood like I bring on. a person home, <laughs> and they're like, what the hell? It's like I was watching Goonies last night, and the guy's like, I have flashlights, whips them out, they're so bright that they blind <laughs> everyone. I That's the second time I've watched it. I watched it like when I was a, when I was maybe a teenager. I watched it again last night mm-hmm. on Blu-ray. Blu-ray's gorgeous. Yes. And I'm going on to my review, and so, like, there are people who fucking despise this film. They're like, the in Goonies. my household, we had E.T. and the never-ending story, but these fuckers oh, have the okay. Goonies. I agree. Never-ending like, story, best thing ever. I'm like, what's wrong with the Goonies? The Goonies, I get a four and a half stars. Good film. Sounds nice. I don't think I can trust you with your ratings anymore. This actually is a good song. How dare you? Oh, yeah. No, I love this song. Are you gonna? You should talk about how much you love this song as soon as it plays. Like I love this song, guys. <laughs> how long have we got left? Um, half an hour. Um, we're on. We're about to hit 50, fifty minutes. Oh, that was quick. Yeah. So that's you, why I was like, we should do a second song. How do we want to wrap it up? Um, I don't know. <laughs> this is on you. This is your episode, isn't it? We've got thirteen seconds. Okay. All right, I'm gonna unmute unmute this now. That was a nice song. It was, wasn't it? Actually, it was rather soothing, oh wasn't God, it? Was, I feel like I should have played 2049 now. That was much As louder. I said, like I was like, it's rather soothing, and then doo-doo-doom. 
What are some of the uh, comparisons you made between Blade Runner the first one, Blade Runner the second one that were very glaringly obvious? Like comparisons? Or like something that you thought like, that's Blade Runner. Um, I mean, the opening shot is a bloody eyeball. That's what I was going to say. Um, the know. opening scene of Blade Runner 2049 is reminiscent of Ridley Scott's uh, 1982 movie, yet radically different. Yeah. So, was that the eye one? Um, no, well, they, they're they probably talking about that actual scene from yeah. the shot. So, Matisse is looking at the actual book that they have, and the opening scene is where they look over, like, the solar farms. Yeah, because I think uh, Dennis wanted to make a, a really big statement with the opening of the film. Yeah, and it was kind of, I think the idea was like how, like, you know, we've left all the resources for make, fueling the electricity and everything in the in probably in LA um, to solar farms that, like, are in, like, where suburban areas probably used to be, mm. but because of the war, everyone's merged into cities. Which is a clever way to do things, I think. Yeah, no, definitely, especially with the whole wastelands Oh, aspects. yeah, I think this film was increasingly clever with what it actually was trying to talk about. Yeah, like the first one was, it, it had the whole atmosphere to the point of like, you know, how Ridley Scott decided to just leave the kind of the camera lingering mm. on shots where characters would walk into a, uh, a building, but they'd have extra extras do all these extra stuff. Which is good because it kind of shows person in place and yeah. how they interact with their world. Yeah, and it gave a lot of, um, yeah, universe building because I was just like, look, this is just how people walk and talk and they ride on their s- cycles and stuff and it's fun. Um, whereas then you have, and that, that the first film was so restricted to the city mm. um, and that was kind of the point. Like, I mean, most noirs are restricted. Very much. It's a, it's a very city base as well. Yeah. And I mean, the, you could arguably take a lot of like social and uh, political commentary out of the first film to the point that this film even still has the USSR. Um, oh. Because, of course, the original yes. film has the USSR. That's nice. Just like how the first film has the big Atari poster and this one has Atari as well. That's so, very true. Um, there are obvious elements that are very much based on the uh, 80s version of the world as if mm. they never died. Um, but this is a more depressing look at it. Which yeah. Is, I feel like what LA in the 80s actually looked like. I also like that this and also the first one really have informed other uh, other stories. So like I was talking to you not on here or before, it really reminds me of Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. Like especially with your saying like the lingering shots of people like doing things. Yeah. That's so Ghost in the Shell and this, yeah, because Ghost in the Shell, the anime came out in 1995. Mm. So that would have probably informed that because a lot of media takes kind of like anything that's profound yeah. or has like a deeper meaningful message. They'll use it in something as like an intertextual layer or something. So yeah. that's why I liked about it. So when I was watching it, I saw different things in it that I kind of like had acquired through um, just watching different things. Yeah. So I liked that aspect of it as well. Yeah. So uh, closing thoughts, I think. Yeah. We're in the last five to six minute segment of the show. We're mm-hmm. only allowed to record for an hour. Yes. Uh, and you could go ridiculous. on forever about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could, I, I could yes. I, I, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm hesitating, but it's like, I don't know, it's one of those things you put on the spot, you expect to oh, talk definitely. for an hour about something. But also, because like, this is such a big film with oh, so yes. many aspects, it's so hard to talk about everything. Yeah. Especially, so, so I'd like, I think we'd stuck to like the main points, Yeah, I think, which is nice. Um, I think, what's the main, what's the main value that you would take out of this film? It made me think about the morality of decisions with technology since I'm always worried about technology. I yeah. think that was a big thing for me. I, f- I think for me it's the uh, kind of depressing look oh, that yeah. technology brings, especially because of K uh, throughout the whole entire film again, looks pretty much just absent and depressed the whole time. Oh my god. And I mean the whole meta- the whole film is kind of like, especially with Joy, uh, mm. reflects on how his life is just cog in the machine pointless yeah. really. Like he doesn't really him not being there wouldn't change anything. Yeah, which is um, really sad because it's kind of like it's people trying to work out what they're doing with their lives as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it is very much that I see myself in K like trying to find out like what I'm gonna do with my life. Yeah. So it kind of really just makes you think. It's one of those movies that you sit back and you're like, it's really pretty, but oh my God, I'm so depressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. Like I think especially Ryan Gosling playing K was is he's a good actor to be like a blank slate kind of actor. Like I he, think that's an insult. No, no, he's he's known for it actually, especially like in Drive. He has oh, yeah. he just has this kind of look on himself that can just be like 
he's just like not all there, but you can reflect yourself onto him. Oh yeah, and it helps to like enhance like the symbolism and the metaphor, especially in the films like Drive and Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Oh yes, um, and he's definitely even in um First Man that he was in in twenty eighteen, mm-hmm. uh, where he played Neil Armstrong. He Neil Armstrong apparently had that kind of a vibe to himself, mm. like he could have this charming personality, but at times. He was just kind of absent-minded. Yeah. And so I think that's why they chose Ryan Gosling to portray him because it was the most realistic also, version Also, there's a huge for. amount of fans as well. He's beautiful. Oh, yeah. But that's besides the point. And he hasn't made a film in all this year. That's true. Yeah. Would you recommend this film to people? Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. What's your rating of it then? I, I mean, look, I go out of five-star rating and I give this one 10. Ah, this is an 11 <laughs> out of 10 for me. Uh. This is so good. Yeah. This is something like... Uh, you can see it in like a theater, like I said, but it's also somebody to like just sit home. If yeah. you like got like a cinema to sit home or put on Netflix or something, put on this. Yeah, I'd I'd say we have a good sound system because as you heard probably from at least one of the songs from this soundtrack, and the soundtrack <sighs> by Hans Zimmer beautiful. is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I I love the soundtrack. Uh, but it's so atmospheric and everything. Mm. So this film with like headphones, even if it's on your laptop, oh as yeah, long as it's like 1080p. It's the best kind of version that isn't. Oh, 4K. oh, definitely. It's it reminds me of kind of like the atmosphere that Interstellar brings because oh, yeah, Hans Zimmer did that as well, didn't? Yes, he? of course. I yeah. also have that soundtrack. And music and sound is important for a film. Oh yeah, and definitely. And that uses it to such a good advantage that it made it kind of a full experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, but no, I would highly recommend. Blade Runner 2049. I guess you don't need to watch the first film, but it helps. You don't. It does. Like it, It's kind of explained to you. Like, yeah. I hadn't seen Blade Runner in ages, and I understood what was going on. Yeah, it, it allows you to understand, uh, like, this film, you could watch it without having watched Blade Runner because mm. the world and everything is the same. It's just yeah. the whole Deckard, Rachel stuff, but they explained it enough in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of like, I kind of think yeah. that, that that's what they thought about as well, because yeah. you've got to do it to appeal for a wider audience, not just the niche fans. That's also my only mild problem with this film, is when they have like the two like flashbacks at the end to mm-hmm. explain like oh that's like Deckard's child and yeah. uh, this part here where it kind of convinces Kate that he's like right at the very end of you know Joy the oh, big yeah, pink yeah. lady telling him you know all this kind of the, stuff your and, favorite scene yes <laughs> and like it ends with um you know the voiceover of the woman saying you know the most you know she like doing something for the right thing it's like yeah. the most human thing someone can do or whatever. Um, and then, of course, cutting back to Dave Bautista saying, oh. uh, you know, you've never seen a miracle. And he's obviously just been like, it's like, he could, you don't exactly need these lines. Like those two, I'd say maybe yes, yeah. because it kind of really reinforces what his mindset mm-hmm. is. But the earlier flashback where it reveals, oh, this is who the kid is. Mm. Um, you don't exactly need, but at the same time, even my mom asked after watching the film, uh, how does he know that that's the daughter? Mm. You know, I'm like, flashbacks. Um, yeah, so I think we'll end this one here. Yes, I think this has been a very productive episode about how much you love this film. Yes. I think I understand now. Yes. And I won't make fun of you anymore. <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you all for listening uh, to Shut Up, We're Talking. That's what I recall. Yes, right? yeah. thank you for listening to us ramble for an hour. Yes, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm your host, Julian Myers. Of course, I'm joined by my friend, Matisse Johnson. Um Co-host, I guess. Yes, yeah. co-host. Yeah. We, uh, we co-created this show. Oh, yes, we oh, did. Definitely. We co-created the crap out of it. <laughs> well, we <laughs> will see you in the next episode where we'll be talking about uh, anime and adaptations. Yes, uh, if it gets broadcast. Hopefully. Let's hope. Yeah. <laughs> Crossing our fingers. Yes. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right, I'm going to play a little song just to tune us out, and even though we won't play the whole song, I don't care. Perfect. Yay. All right. Yay. See, this is why you make notes. Yes. I just thought because I needed something to like look uh, at. We've passed the hour and 30, uh, 30 seconds. I think 30 minutes. I was like, Jesus Christ. No, it's just because I want to allow an extra time so the start yes. of it can be cut out properly. All right, you think we're good? Yes.